Hello, good evening, welcome to Newsnight. We are broadcasting from our studios here at Northridge in Accra. My name is Kenneth. Jesse, here are stories making headlines tonight. Amidst the worsening economic conditions and government's plans to secure an IMF support program, Finance Minister Kenneth Furiata is confident of a turnaround for the economy by December 2022. Africa Center for Energy Policy maintains position that the GMPC is causing 1.5 billion US dollars financial loss to the state despite attempt by MP for Adansia Sukwa, Katie Hammond, to discredit their recent revelations. MP KT Hammond condemns the heckling of President Kufuado at the just ended Global Citizen Festival over Ghana's economic woes, but concerned youth are hitting back. Also coming up, Chief Justice Inimi Abua defends the integrity of the judiciary in the wake of recent accusations of officials, including judges, breaking the law. Let's now settle for the details as the Finance Minister Kenneth Furiata says government is currently working on a debt sustainability analysis with the International Monetary Fund to formally pave way for the release of funds to support the Ghanaian economy which has been in crisis for years. During a press conference on Wednesday, Kenneth Furiata expressed hope that a deal will be secured by the end of the year. Press engagement by the Finance Minister was to enable him provide an update on Ghana's ongoing negotiations for an economic bailout from the International Monetary Fund. Among other positive indicators, the finance minister mentioned that Ghana's economy is recording some marginal growth despite recent external shocks. Current year expenditure has also largely been contained owing to the operationalization of expenditure cuts announced since March. We are on course with expenditure rationalization efforts and will continue to enforce strict adherence to these measures across all MDAs whilst ensuring efficient delivery of public services. He also stressed that government has intensified efforts to show up domestic revenue mobilization, particularly in relation to the enforcement of compliance measures in a bid to resolve the country's fiscal challenges. The increased visibility of GR officials at shopping malls and various commercial establishments and our, at our borders across the country is in pursuit of meeting our revenue objectives. Such exercises form part of an ongoing drive to ensure we take significant steps forward in remedying long-standing challenges with domestic revenue mobilization, indiscipline, corruption and leakages. Ken Oforiata also said government was currently working on the debt sustainability analysis with the IMF to formally pave way for a bailout. The IMF mission will cover a period of 10 days and in line of His Excellency the President's dialogue with the IMF Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva, negotiations will be fast-tracked to ensure the key aspects of the program are reflected in the 2023 annual budget statement in November 2022. Government is committed to ensuring that a comprehensive package is negotiated with the aim of restoring and sustaining macroeconomic stability, ensuring durable and inclusive growth, and promoting social protection. The finance minister also pledged that government will always protect funds of people in the financial sector to boost confidence in the banking sector. In other stories tonight, the executive director of Africa Center for Energy Policy, Benjamin Boacher, says his outfit still maintains its position that the GMPC is causing 1.5 billion U.S. dollars financial loss to the state, despite attempts by the member of parliament for Adansia Sukwa, K.T. Hammond, to discredit the publications.
Civil society groups Imani Africa and Africa Center for Energy Policy have alleged that Ghana buys gas for $95.8 million and sells to a U.S.-based Ghanaian-owned energy company, Gensa Energy Holdings, for $43.5 million, accounting for a $1.5 billion financial loss to the state. According to Member of Parliament for Adansi Asokwa, who doubles as Member of Mines and Energy Committee, Katie Hammond, after a thorough investigation by the committee, the reports presented by the think tank were inaccurate. The tune of 1.5 billion. You see, this is sensational stuff. It's not a good thing. Yes, we met them. We met with the um, GMPC, um, uh, which uh, is supposed to have uh, uh, entered into what do you call it? Sweetheart, whatever. Sweetheart, yeah. sweetheart deal with whatever. You know? and, uh, it's, it's appalling. You see, you, I, I, I don't know. I'm a bit uncomfortable. This whole thing has brought us here. And it's so highfalutin. You, 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 you make that thing sound like the world is coming to an end. Meanwhile, the executive director of ASA, Benjamin Boache, in a swift response, has urged KT Hammond to argue with facts. According to him, documents available indicate GNPC is causing financial loss to the state with the amount of subsidy given to Gensa Energy. Let everybody come around and let's you know, interrogate the numbers. And we still stand by the fact that the discount that we are providing to Gensa is $1.5 billion. If you look at its impact on the total energy sector, you're looking at about $3.6 billion. So that has to be explained away. What are we getting in return for that kind of a, you know, subsidy that we are granting to a private uh, a company? And I don't think we should allow uh, politicization or accusation or insult to divert attention. In a related interview, John Chinapo, ranking member of the Mines and Energy Committee, blamed the economic management team for the prevailing predicament. I was in a meeting yesterday as the ranking member on the minority side. Let me confirm to you that GMPC couldn't answer most of the questions. They couldn't tell us the financial analysis underpinning those discounts. All they told us was that the economic management team gave approval for some of these agreements. And I hold the vice president and the economic management team directly responsible. The vice president and the economic management team is the root cause of all the problems that we are having. Right, let's bring you some education-related stories tonight as four labor unions in the public universities in Ghana, namely UTAG, Ghana Association of University Administrators, Tertiary Education Workers' Union of Ghana, and the Senior Staff Association of Universities of Ghana have announced their intention to withdraw their services come October 5th, 2022, if government does not keep its side of an earlier negotiated agreement on their conditions of service. According to these labor unions, the employer has delayed in the payment of their research and book allowances. They also accused their employer of creating a class system which will create a division among workers of the public universities in the country. While the association is impressing on the members to remain calm and steadfast, the association has vowed to resist any attempt by the employer to the very terms of conditions they agreed without due process. Now, I've been joined on the telephone line by Dr. Samuel Nkumban, who is the president of the University of Ghana's branch of University Teachers Association of Ghana. Doc, good evening. Welcome to Newsnight. Good evening. And right, so we've witnessed a series of strike and negotiations between you and the government. Should the government not meet your ultimatum and you proceed on another strike, what will be different about this particular one? Well, thank you very much. The uh, reality is this, that we are getting to that break point where we are tired of finding agreements with government and then uh, we obey or oblige in terms of the terms that we put into those agreements. And then on the side of our employer, uh, it's as though uh, we don't matter, and that uh, what they put there is a matter of uh, exigency to get us back into the classroom. And so, I mean, when, and usually when you get to that big point, you, you can understand and you can appreciate that 
uh, apprehension amongst members is getting very high. And I just hope and hope against hope that we don't get there this time around. Right. When last did you sit with your employer and what was the outcome of that meeting? So we had a couple of uh, agreements signed with government. The first was in the June of 2021, at which we agreed on some payroll allowances. In that same agreement, we also uh, indicated that government would have to review the fuel allowances paid to members at least twice every year, given the fact that uh, the increments that are coming in relation to fuel is not something that is uh, sustainable if we were to maintain the old rates. And so from June 2021 until June this year, there had not been any review, which I didn't raise any red flag because we were also monitoring in terms of the so-called economic uh, situations. Then comes June this year when an announcement from government comes to indicate that we were, were increasing the fuel rates from the then 6.05 cities per liter to 10.99 cities per liter, which was of course welcome news to us because uh, over the year, the review that had to be done in two trenches didn't happen. Unfortunately, barely a month after we received notice again that that increment affects only uh, duty bearers and that it is not for the generality of the unions that work within campus or the employees within the university system. And we, we thought that was uh, inappropriate. Besides that, the, immediate, the first one that came had to do with the fact that if you were a duty bearer and you were entitled to fuel, we came in gallons, it came in measure of gallons, say you are, maybe you are entitled to five gallons, somebody is entitled to 10 gallons. The initial letter that came was to suggest that we, they were no longer going to calibrate in gallons, but rather that they were given an absolute figure in terms of monetary terms. And all of these happened without recourse to the employee, because you cannot vary my condition of service without negotiating with me. And if, there, if there's good reason to want to make those changes, the law requires you to at least engage with the person who is the manufacturer in this matter. And that has not happened. We wrote to government uh, indicating our displeasure with the unilateral decisions that it is taking. Um, the very recent one, we did write to the National Labor Commission complaining that our uh, employer is buying our conditions of service without recourse to us. Labor Commission wrote to government indicating that within seven working days, it should give us a feedback. And as we speak, that has not happened. And so, in fact, there's, there's so many of them. And the recent book and research allowances for which we suspended the strike, the agreement was that by end of August, we will be paid. As we speak, we have not been paid. Right. And so it's a whole series of uh, government not meeting this part of the bargain that is leading us into uh, another set of crises, so to speak, when it comes to uh, tertiary uh, education space. Right. Dr. Nkuma, looking at the current economic situation of the country, would it not seem insensitive to embark on a strike at the moment? Well, we just have indicated that within one week we expect some feedback, and if we don't get the feedback, then we call, we convene and take a decision as to one next line of action. Um, however, like, I mean, it's reality that the law requires you to engage whoever it is that you want to vary the person's condition of service. And if it's not acceptable in any case to vary the condition of service, that negatively affects the person. And so these engagements have not happened. Unilaterally, you sit in your office and write a letter giving directives as to what has to happen. And we think that they thought it's not fair uh, in dealing with the uh, labor unions as well and that is where we find ourselves right dr samuel Nkumban, thanks very much for your time tonight thank you for having me now in other stories also related to education the ministry of education says it has begun an inter-agency dialogue to absorb students returning from war-torn ukraine now this comes after the ghana medical council issued 
a statement indicating that it will not recognize students with medical and dental degree certificates issued by medical and dental schools from Ukraine in 2022 until normal academic activities resume. We will not allow people who have not seen patients to sit down because if there, there is war, nobody knows when it's going to end. So if you are in the first year and you continue to do online course, as for the university, they'll be happy to collect your money. We heard it that they said the academic year is ending, so they should come and pay. Some parents were worried. That's the reason why we said that we will finish everything that we are doing so that they can enter the next academic year, which is starting in September, October, and some of them in January. Some of them have even started. So the students who have been a place who have to go quickly to their schools and go and do the academic year. And they said, no, I'll continue this and then sit down and then come and say, why don't you allow me to use my online course to register in Ghana and see who? Going to see only your relatives or going to see people in Ghana. I will not allow such person to see me when I'm sick. But I don't know. I'm a potential patient. All of us are potential patients. We don't know where we will meet the person on the street or in the hospital. So please, that's how it is. And I think we've done this. We've opened this avenue. It's a, a lifetime avenue once. We open it. And when the Nigerians heard it, they were all surprised. Everybody said, hey, you've done well. And we are even convincing them to do the same thing for their people. But if you don't take advantage of it, it's a free world. So you don't come back and complain to anybody. And I'm very happy that Medicare and Dental Council, after the exams, they didn't do it before the exams. It was after the exams on 23rd of September, gave this statement that we, would, we will not and they, they said that they will not register anybody who does online course. And we all know that Ukraine has a problem. There's a war in Ukraine. So there's no way that you can go and sit in the hospital and see patients in Ukraine. So the hospitals I'm, I know have even been bombed. So what are you going to do the online course? But I don't blame them. They are university. They are still in their offices doing the online course to collect their fees and everything. That's why it's happening. But we are taking note of, uh, note of this and we want to make sure as a country that we also increase the number of students that we can take in this country to train them. And the, we have plans are far ahead to make sure that we do this and do it very well and decentralize medical education. Once we decentralize medical education, you can take more students and train them because we need a lot of doctors. Now we are putting up about 101 uh, hospitals the state hospitals and seven regional hospitals and three psychiatric hospitals. We need doctors, we need nurses, we need health professionals. So any way that we can increase the number of our doctors in this country, we'll do it. And that's one of the reasons we didn't want about 900 students who are in Ukraine, who are doing medicine, to just stop their courses and then come and sit home. That's why the president said, do everything possible to integrate these students into our universities here in Ghana. So the way was open. We opened the avenue. The universities were very willing to assist, assist, assist us because we are not in normal times. And I'm very happy the students who have taken part in this assessment. And we wish them well. And those who didn't take part, wherever they are, as the Medical Data Council said, if you want to come back to this country and work. This is Newsnight on Metro Television. Let's bring you more stories tonight as the Member of Parliament for Adansia Sokwa, Katie Hammond has condemned the heckling of President Akufuado as the just ended global festival uh, in Accra, according to the Adansia Sokwa legislator. Despite the current economic challenges in the country, Ghanaians must respect the president. <laughs> And now, or buy one cabbia and your political platforms to cramp or buy it. And now, all children say, Oh, this is the idea, and the depending on how we are so be about, oh, I mean, I would have more. And that's your no, Mabuna, my year, you know, no one, the idea of a catcher, Munya would say. Well, in Penfonio, my one, the idea of a car, as somebody as you have a car, yeah, yeah, I say, you have a car, you have a you can say you go home, mono, no, 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 no,
Money up political importance, and be a and your political rally, and your she, and your moon yabutre, Munsia, no more yea, Monomana, moon may a moon pity for. Now, I said, Policy, now, sir, and I do be at them. Democrats and Abbas will be ye. Now, it's been for so yet, and your possible say, big diamond, what I don't want my moon yet, number one, moon just yet. What ya, what you take about what we don't want to let them from us any other, and if you any more. Some very strong words used by the legislator. But let's go to social media because they have been reacting to his statement. And this one says, something honorable has forgotten is that Ghana is waking from its sleep. We won't wait till elections before we tell our leaders that we are not satisfied with the way they are handling their economy. I was very surprised, but again happy it happened at a non-political platform. This one says, speaking of respect, he just called the youth coconut heads. Oh, really? This is actually a brief statement expressing how the leaders of Ghana perceive the youth to be. No wonder the whole country is in a mess. We can only express our displeasure about the state of the economy on a political platform. What with Africans and this placing relevance on old age? The booing got to them, but not the cries of Ghanaians. That is from Richard Otis. And this says, an elder who lies, ludes, and deceives the youth does not deserve respect from the youth. Someone should tell Katie Hammond that. This one says, I don't have any issue with the youth respecting the elderly. What I have an issue with is how the elderly have run down the economy and having made it difficult for the youth to survive. For the past 30 years, our Bain as a country has been with politicians and old men. Right, so let's go on to the telephone lines and speak to Emmanuel Wilson, who is a member for the Crusaders Against Corruption, for a conversation on the back of this. Emmanuel, grateful to have you join me tonight. Now, what do you make of Katie Hammond's statement? Hello, Emmanuel Wilson, can you hear me? Hello, Emmanuel. We're struggling to get into contact with Emmanuel Wilson, who is a member for the Crusaders Against Corruption. But in the meantime, Chief Justice Anil Yabua has urged judges and magistrates to execute their mandate as required by law without fear of criticism. The judicial system is not complete until there are good judges who execute their mandates professionally in the interest of the people they serve employing the entire rudiment for freedom and justice. It is on this mantra that the Chief Justice, Justice Kwesiani Niyabua, urged the judges and magistrates at the 41st general meeting ahead of the new legal year not to be frightened by criticism when discharging their duties backed by law. While underlying the freedom of the public in general and interest groups in particular to criticize the judiciary, I wish to reiterate that this should always be done within the boundaries of the law. Freedoms everywhere has no absolute value. Simply put, freedom of speech has its limits. This is an incontestable fact, and we should all bear in mind when dealing with institutions of state like the judiciary. On his part, Deputy Attorney General Alfred Twaye Bois said public opinions are guided by their misinterpretations of the law, hence judges and magistrates should be vigilant in their routine to defend their own independence. President of the Ghana Bar Association pledged to use his outfit to address the challenges. The judiciary is not perfect and infallible. However, the proper tools and methods for correcting and improving the work of the judiciary are through constructive criticisms and superior arguments, not acts that target their personalities, undermine their independence, insult the bench, bring dishonor to the administration of justice, and endanger, and endanger their security and safety. The 41st Association of Judges and Magistrates of Ghana General Meeting, expected to span for three days, is on the theme maintaining integrity of the judiciary amidst challenges of democratic rights and freedom.
Phil on the judiciary, president of the Association of Magistrates and Judges Ghana, has debunked criticism from the public targeted at bringing their judgment and mandate to disrepute. There have been articles, commentaries by all sorts of people, social commentators, impugning the motives and integrity of judges where matters affecting the judiciary are blown out of proportion, are blown out of proportion. It is against this background that we have chosen the theme for this year's conference to dwell on how we as judges and the judiciary as an institution, how we maintain the integrity of the judiciary while it's accepting and allowing the citizenry to exercise their democratic and constitutional right to freedom of speech and expression as guaranteed under Article 21 of the Constitution 1992. We have been attacked, we have been maligned, and all sorts of things have been said about judges. It is my view that evaluating or analyzing judges and their judgment should focus on how judges apply the law to arrive at a result or a decision, but should not be focused simply on what the result might be or by which but be or which of the parties to the litigation the decision favors. Judges, by the nature of our work, cannot go onto radio, television, or social media to defend ourselves, and this is what our critics sometimes fail to appreciate. In my view, impugning the motives of judges is actually undermining the integrity of a judiciary. Well, I have an announcement from the ECG for all concerned as the Electricity Company of Ghana Limited wishes to inform their cherished customers that due to a technical challenge which has affected their prepaid metering systems, purchase of electricity credit card has been interrupted. Some customers in the following areas have been affected. That is Volta, Kumasi, Accra, Takrade, Tema, Cape Coast, Kaswa, Weneba, Suedro, Kuforidria, Nkoko, and Tafo. Affected customers should please note that their ICT team is working assiduously to correct the anomaly and restore the system to normalcy. They say they wish to apologize for the inconvenience caused by this technical challenge. Right, so let's now take a look at the realities on the ground where customers in the central region are unable to purchase credit for their prepaid meter. Several residents and businesses in the region are heavily affected as a result of the situation. The affected customers say they have been thrown into various vending points, including the main ECG offices, for several days but are unable to purchase credit for their prepaid meters. The development has rendered them to sleep in darkness. For those who run businesses that rely on constant power supply, such as cold stores, they have begun recording losses as their products have started going bad. At the various offices, disappointed and frustrated customers are turned away as some offices have displayed no network inscriptions. Here are some customers speaking to Metro News. My credits got finished at around 5 p.m. yesterday. I went to a vendor in my area but couldn't buy. I came to a man from the old office in Kaswa and New Market but still couldn't purchase credit. I have come here today too and they are saying nothing. We are in darkness. We are unable to buy power for four days now. My wife even thought I was telling lies, so she accompanied me to the vending point today. The ECG says there is no network. Most items in our fridges are going to waste, so please help us. We are in a difficult situation. When we come here, there is no one to speak to. Our items are going waste. 
I have not been able to buy power since yesterday. My child has been combing various points. We have come here today too and we are still not able to buy credit. We are really suffering. Meanwhile, Central Regional Manager for the Electricity Company of Ghana, Ankuma Emmanuel, has assured that the company's engineers are working hard to restore the network in order to make it possible for customers to purchase credit. Let's take you back to our earlier story where the Member of Parliament for Adansiasukwa, Katie Hammond, has described the youth as coconut heads for uh, attacking the president at the Global Citizen Award and uh, speak to Emmanuel Wilson, who is a member for the Crusaders Against Corruption. Emmanuel, can you hear me? Good evening. Welcome to Newsnight. Hello, Emmanuel. Right, we are still unable to connect with Emmanuel on the telephone lines to uh, share his thoughts on what the president, as uh, Heckler was about, and what Katie Hammond described the youth. Now, need to make an urgent call, but you realize that you don't have credit, or your very important conversation was cut short because you ran out of airtime. Cut the stress because all you have to do on MTN is dial star five zero six hash and you get to borrow credit on MTN Extra Time. The best part is you can also borrow data by dialing the same number, that is star 506 hash, and you can bundle data whenever you run out to continue browsing as always. Your conversations don't need to end. Borrow Extra Time now and enjoy the things you love on your favorite network, MTN. Right, and still to come in this bulletin, Sam Guineans are kicking against the government's mass vaccination of dogs aimed at eradicating rabies across the country. That's what's coming up after the break. I try my business now, I have fun. Because Ghana, I'm up for the gray. And then say, I come and I am Nambia. I am Yahoo. I am Yahoo. Hello again. Sam Guineans are kicking against government's mass vaccination for dogs aimed at eradicating rabies across the country by 2030. The skeptics, mainly lovers of dog meat, say vaccination turns the meat sour, hence they are reason for not vaccinating their dogs. My colleague Henry Kwesibudu has been speaking with Sam Guineans on the occasion of World Rabies Day and has come through with the following report. As part of efforts to attain herd immunity of dogs by the year 2030, owners of pets have been advised by public health experts to vaccinate them at least once a year. But how often do people vaccinate their dogs? And what are some of the myths surrounding vaccinating dogs in parts of the country? In our part of the world, dogs are not loved just because they are adorable pets, companions, all security animals. They are also loved for their meat. Yes, dog meat is a delicacy for many. On the occasion of world rabies, in the time of an outbreak of rabies in the Ashanti region, one would have thought that dog owners will be concerned about getting their pet dogs vaccinated against the 100% fatal disease. But no, here at La, in Accra, some residents don't subscribe to the vaccination of dogs, even though the La Nadekotopo Municipal Assembly is embarking on a free vaccination exercise to mark the World Rabies Day. The turnout is low. Some of the residents believe the chemicals for inoculation gives it meat a taste that isn't desired by persons who love dog meat. <laughs> Now, 
Reginald is a veterinary officer at Ladma. It's not encouraging. There's still more room for improvement. I think with um, uh, more sensitization and more awareness creation, the people would get to know and get to hear about it and also come in for the vaccination. First and foremost, uh, resources, financial resources, um, because to, to achieve that target, you need to continuously vaccinate dogs over a period and probably 70 to 80 percent of the dog population over a period of three to five years to completely eradicate uh, the, 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 the rabies. So we need a lot of resources to create awareness, a lot of resources to buy vaccines, to buy the uh, consumables like the syringes and all. So basically that is it. And then also um, we have a little challenge with, you know, um, dog owners, some have refused to vaccinate. Even when the vaccination is free, they still refuse to vaccinate due to certain myths or beliefs they have. For 44 year old Adongo Imloke, who is a resident of Zongo Junction at Kanishi, 50 cities cost of vaccination per dog is exorbitant. I cry my business now, you're fine. Because Ghana, no, I'm not for be brave. And I'm saying, I'm not for be brave. And I'm saying, Ya we are ya hunting war, Namunum. Ya san ya esa ya lea war, Namunum. Namne esa ya lea be bree. E obiwa, chale, any name be war. E gugunu ho. I drew a motto, I drew a mow, and I say be be say no, sa namina, a chuchasa name, name a pea, namne a boa mire. But Namno, nititrini ya, a hondia, oh, we are hondin be a wukutano. I am Hondi, I am Papa. Ne, inti namno me me yano, niji mano. Aman fo bi bre Papa. For those with dogs which are foreign breeds, intense sensitization and vaccination are the only ways to curb in rabies. Reginald Okain is the CEO Vom House Dog Farm at Osu. Rabies infection comes from those stray dogs. Cause we hear like this, you know, we are updating ourselves when it comes to vaccinations, shots. Yes, so it's more of like everything is on point because we are doing high standard breeding here. Yes, so if really government has an initiative, it means he has to push for it, for those stray dogs, because there are a lot of stray dogs working without shots. With me, I have a personal vet that comes home. So I have, every dog has a health book, health card or health book that every shot is being recorded and the next time for the next shot to be um, given. So we just keep track record of that with, with the uh, record. And any time it's ready, either I take them to the vet or the vet comes home. Until government intensifies its sensitization effort aimed at achieving herd immunity of 70% of dog population in the country, its aim of eradicating rabies by 2030 looks One man's meat is indeed another man's poison. Let's take you back to our earlier story once again, where the Member of Parliament for Adansi Asukwa, Katie Hammond, has condemned the heckling of President Akufuado at the just-ended Global Citizen Festival. According to the Adansi Asukwa legislator, despite the economic challenges in the country, Ghanaians must respect the president. Let's now go into the telephone lines and speak to Emmanuel Wilson, who is a member for the Crusaders Against Corruption. Emmanuel, good evening. I believe you can hear me now. Welcome to Newsnight. Good evening and thank you. And uh, right. kindly, yes, I'm a member of Crusaders Against Corruption, but I'm also the chief crusader. Indeed. Now, let, let, me, let me pick your thought on what the legislator made of the heckling by the youth. Well, it raises two issues. First and foremost, it is unfortunate, and let me condemn, uh, grossly condemn the comments that came from a member of parliament who is supposed to be addressed as a honorable member, and for that matter, he's supposed to act in an honorable way. Let me condemn the comments that came from him with regards to how he described the youth. It is so interesting that this is a member of parliament who, in his quest to advise the youth, 
against or to encourage the youth to respect the elderly and to condemn what he determines as disrespect. He rather went further to disrespect the youth by using words that amount to insult. And this we need to condemn. It must not come from someone who is representing a whole constituency, someone who is representing us in parliament, someone who is making laws, and for that matter can be described as a role model in society. Such words should not be seen coming from such a person. And all of us must condemn. And if Katie Hammond is listening to us and listening to our program this evening, I expect that he will come out and apologize if indeed he wants us to continue to regard him as an honorable member. Secondly, what we should know is that the action that came from the youth is a representation of what is going on among the youth. If a youth or a group of youth will want to come out and disrespect or disregard the presence of the president to the extent that they did not even want to hear what the president wanted to say, it communicates clearly that we have in this country a group of youth who justifiably have decided that they are no more having faith in the words of the president. And that is a worry. And that is where I was expecting that everyone, including Katie Hammond, would have focused on the issue. The issue is that the youth exhibited a sign of disappointment in the president. They exhibited a sign of frustration in the president through that act. And rightly so, and justifiably, if the youth decide to express such disappointment. They have every right to do so because this is the president that promised that they were going to, he was going to ensure that he tackles youth unemployment. Today, as we speak, statistically, youth unemployment in this country has escalated. And that is a worry. People graduate and they, know, they do not have any hope anymore. The average youth in this country doesn't have any hope anymore. And so when they see a president who is supposed to give them hope, and that president over the past six years has only communicated to them that there's no hope for them and there's no hope for their future, they have every right to do that. I would have been disappointed if the youth had decided to take to arms or had decided to physically attack the president. Right. But when they decided not to attack the president physically, but decided to express their frustration, all of us, particularly individuals coming from parliament, because Katie Hammond and the parliamentarians represent the youth and represent their consti the constituencies that they come from. And so I was expecting that Katie Hammond would have used the platform to rather encourage the youth and to rather admonish the leadership of which he is part of, that they need to do more to restore the hope Right. that the youth have lost in the leadership of this country. Right. Emmanuel, he also did mention that the youth are not capable of managing the country, so they do not have any right to attack the president. What would you say to that? That is, that is extremely unfortunate and shameful. And truly, if I belong to Katie Hammond's uh, constituency, just on what he has said alone, I would have taken a direct decision that this man is not fit to lead us in parliament or represent us in parliament anymore. The truth of the matter is this. Let us look at, and assuming without admitting that what J.T. Hammond is saying is true. Over the past years, we've had individuals who are claiming to be outside the youth bracket leading this country. What has been the state of this country? Katie Hammond should rather be ashamed because from all indications, today as we speak, the so-called grown up who Katie Hammond belongs to, and he claimed that they are managing this country better than the right. youth, and so the youth should be quiet. Under their leadership, today mm. as we speak, the dollar is one dollar to over 10 Ghana cities. People right. cannot even buy petrol in this country. Indeed, Emmanuel Please, Wilson. Though, we uh, cannot have it. I'm afraid we'll have to uh, end the conversation here tonight. But thank you very much for speaking to us tonight. Emmanuel Wilson is the Chief Crusader for Crusaders Against Corruption. We'll be back with the latest in business news.
Good evening and welcome back to News Night Live on Metro TV. My name is Winston Taki. And now to a false business story. Assessing loans when cash strapped with just a click on your mobile phone is easy, but it is a big deal for some people to pay back. This is, however, no escape as the Bank of Ghana is warning defaulters who refuse to register their SIM cards to think twice because even if they discard them, they will be unable to access loans from other financial institutions. It is a lifesaver in times of crash crisis. With just a click, mobile phone users can access loans up to 1,000 CDs from their network providers who have teamed up with some financial institutions to provide such services. A study by the World Bank indicates that mobile money services have a positive impact on poverty reduction. It can enhance financial inclusion by providing access to savings, credit and insurance services. The Bank of Ghana also reports that in 2021, there were 40.9 million registered mobile money accounts and 17.5 million active accounts. The loan service offered by telecom companies attracts a fixed monthly interest. The fee is added to the loan amount to give the customer the value to pay back before or on the due date. When the due date elapses, a penalty fee is applied for defaulting. But in their quest to evade the system, some persons who have accessed the funds and are unable to pay either discard their SIM cards or cease using them. This has forced the Bank of Ghana to issue a statement cautioning all defaulters. The central bank says persons who fail to repay their loans will have a hard time to access loan facilities from other financial or credit institutions in the future. It's, it's, it's worth calling for. Well, we can't afford to lose such a huge sum of money to some few people. Marshal Mashud Umaro is vice president of Mobile Money Agents Association of Ghana. Uh, those that have loaned don't pay back with the energy that they use in requesting for it. It is a slight challenge, but I think that uh, most people are trying to pay and they are even paying. It's however urging the central bank to hasten slowly. If it's in order, uh, we may want to hasten slowly in, you know, enforcing these directives. Uh, give in July this year, the government revised the country's overall fiscal deficit target in 2022 to 6.6% .6 of gross domestic product, that is the GDP, from the earlier 7.4%. Meanwhile, the former finance minister, Seth Tekpe, has questioned why the government has failed to manage the substantial foreign inflows even during COVID-19 to help alleviate the economic woes of Ghanaians. If you look at past crises, including you know, bushfires, you know, um, fall in the price of cocoa, together with the bushfires which decimated, droughts, that's the domestic ones. And you look at the external or external ones falling commodity prices, and the external ones like the last two, or let's say the last before COVID, we have never gotten the resources, apart from the hippie era, which had some significant flows coming in at the time of the drought. Even then we started borrowing and going up again. This is the largest flow that came in to help, you know, one disease, however tough it is. The IMF, one billion, another one billion to one SDR on the heels of World Bank. You know, together with other lenders like African Development Bank, take it another billion. That'll be all for business. My name is Winston Taki. Sports is next with Phil John Corte. It's 55 past 19 hours CMT here in Accra. It's time for Sports on Newsnight. My name is Phil John Quarte. Ahead of the start of the Mundial on the 20th of November 2022, former Youth and Sports Minister Elvis Efriyankwa is challenging the Blasters to improve if they have to take on the lives of Uruguay, Portugal and South Korea. The matches by their nature are meant to test the team's preparedness. And therefore, 
from a technical point of view, the results may not really be important, even though it's, it shows it's an indication of something. We still have more room for improvement, and we still have some time, and so they should use the rest of the time to work on that. I, I don't think it's only international friendlies that they can use to train. I recall in our time, we played with a lot of local teams, and that is also a way of building up the team. The, the, th the thing is to get the players to sharpen their skills. So beyond this big international tournament that everybody is watching, if they would listen to my advice, they should do more, you know, get local teams, maybe even of a lower division. And that would give them the opportunity to hone some skills and tactics and strategies that they want to deploy going forward. But who am I? Elvis Ifiyankra is a former youth and sports minister challenging the Blasters to improve before the media starts on the 20th of November 2022 in Qatar. That's your sports up next, Showbiz. In entertainment tonight, Ghanaian musician Kirani Ayat wants compensation for the use of his intellectual property by the government of Ghana in its Visit Ghana campaign advertised on social media. Here's the story so far. The video to his music, Guda, the, the Ghana Tourism Authority explained. This is a case, this is a video produced in 2019 as mm -hmm. part of the year of return. Yeah. Shown it severally. We have an agreement with uh, an agency that brought us footage belonging to them. Yeah that we can use, we've used it. This is not a new video. President just retweets a video that is already out there. However, the musician has revealed he owns the exclusive rights to the visuals and finds it appalling that the authority could issue such a statement. In his reply, he mentioned, and I quote, In response to the statement issued this morning by the Ghana Tourism Authority, I, Kirani Ayat, would like to categorically state that no agency has any rights whatsoever to my intellectual property. International News is next. President Cyril Ramaphosa denies accusations of money laundering and bribery to cover up a February 2020 heist at his game farm. The opposition wants Ramaphosa to answer questions about the scandal, but he refused to answer questions in Parliament. He says he wants law enforcement agencies investigating the case to be given the space to do their work. The Bank of England says it will step in to claim markets after the government's tax cutting plans sparked a fall in the pound and caused borrowing costs to surge. The bank will start buying government bonds at an urgent pace to help restore market conditions. It comes after the currency hit a record low on Monday following the Chancellor's mini-budget, which pledged $45 billion worth of tax cuts. Hurricane Ian has turned into Western Cuban as a Category 3 storm, knocking out power lines in the country of 11.3 million people. The storm brought down electricity grid and left the entire island without power before barreling towards Florida.